Chapter 29 of The Money Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Money Moon, a romance by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter 29 of The Moon's Message to Small Porges, and How He Told It to Bellew, in a Whisper. Bellew walked on at a good pace with his back turned resolutely towards the house of Dapplemere, and thus, as he swung into that narrow grassy lane that wound away between trees, he was much surprised to hear a distant hail. Facing sharp about, he espied a diminutive figure whose small legs trotted very fast, and whose small fist waved a weather-beaten cap. Bellew's first impulse was to turn and run. But Bellew rarely acted on impulse. Therefore he set down the bulging portmanteau, seated himself upon it, and, taking out pipe and tobacco, waited for his pursuer to come up. "'Oh, Uncle Porges!' panted a voice. "'You did walk so awful fast, and I called and called, but you never heard. And now, please, where are you going?' "'Going,' said Bellew, searching through his pockets for a match. "'Going, my Porges? Why, um, for a stroll, to be sure. Just a walk before breakfast, you know. But then, why have you brought your bag?' bag repeated bellew stooping down to look at it why so i have please why persisted small porges suddenly anxious why did you bring it well i expect it was to er uh, to bear me company but how is it you are out so very early my porges why, I couldn't sleep last night, you know, cause I kept on thinking and thinking about the fortune. So I got up in the middle of the night and dressed myself and sat in the big chair by the window and looked at the money moon. And I stared at it and stared at it till a wonderful thing happened. And what do you suppose? I don't know. Well, all at once, while I stared up at it, the moon changed itself into a great big face. But I didn't mind a bit, because it was a very nice sort of face, rather like a gnome's face, only without the beard, you know. And while I looked at it, it talked to me, and it told me a lot of things. And that's how I know that you are going away, because you are, you know, aren't you? Why, my porches, said Bellew, fumbling with his pipe. Why, shipmate, I... Since you ask me, I am. Yes, I was afraid the moon was right, said Small Porges, and turned away. But Bellow had seen the stricken look in his eyes, therefore he took Small Porges in the circle of his big arm, and holding him thus, explained to him how that in this great world each of us must walk his appointed way, and that there must and always will be partings, but that also there must and always shall be meetings. And so, my Porges, if we have to say good-bye now, the sooner we shall meet again, some day, somewhere. But small Porges only sighed, and shook his head in hopeless dejection. Does she know you're going? I mean, my Auntie Anthea? Oh, yes, she knows, Porges. Then I suppose that's why she was crying so, in the night. Crying? Yes, she's cried an awful lot lately, hasn't she? Last night, when I woke up, you know, and couldn't sleep, I went into her room, and she was crying, with her face hidden in the pillow, and her hair all about her. Crying? Yes, and she said she wished she was dead. So then, of course, I tried to comfort her, you know, and she said, I'm a dreadful failure, Georgie, dear, with the farm and everything else. I've tried to be a father and mother to you, and I failed in that, too. So now I'm going to give you a real father. And she told me she was going to marry Mr. Cassilis. But I said, no, 
"'cause I arranged for her to marry you and live happy ever after. But she got awful angry again, and said she'd never marry you if you were the last man in the world, cause she spised you so. <laughs> and that would seem to settle it, nodded Bellew gloomily. So it's good-bye, my Porges. We may as well shake hands now and get it over. And Bellew rose from the portmanteau, and, sighing, held out his hand. Oh, but wait a minute, cried Small Porges eagerly. I haven't told you what the moon said to me last night. Ah, to be sure, we were forgetting that, said Bellew with an absent look and a trifle wearily. Why then, please sit down again so I can speak into your ear, cause what the moon told me to tell you is a secret, you know. So perforce, Bellew reseated himself upon his portmanteau, and, drawing Small Porges close, bent his head down to the anxious little face. And so, Small Porges told him exactly what the moon had said. And the moon's message, whatever it was, seemed to be very short and concise, as all really important messages should be. But these few words had a wondrous and magical effect upon George Bellew. For a moment he stared wide-eyed at Small Porges like one awaking from a dream. Then the gloom vanished from his brow, and he sprang to his feet. And, being upon his feet, he smote his clenched fist down into the palm of his hand with a resounding smack. "'By heaven!' he exclaimed, and took a turn to and fro across the width of the lane, and, seeing Small Porges watching him, caught him suddenly up in his arms and hugged him. "'And the moon will be at the full to-night,' said he. Thereafter he sat him down upon his portmanteau again, with small porges upon his knee, and they talked confidentially together, with their heads very close together, and in muffled tones. When at last Bellew rose, his eyes were bright and eager, and his square chin prominent and grimly resolute. "'So you quite understand, my porges?' "'Yes, yes, oh, oh, I understand. Where the little bridge spans the brook, the trees are thicker there. Aye, aye, Captain. Then fare thee well, shipmate. Good-bye, my Porges. And remember. So they clasped hands very solemnly, big Porges and small Porges, and turned each his appointed way, the one up, the other down the lane. But lo, as they went, small Porges's tears were banished quite and Bellew strode upon his way, his head held high, his shoulders squared, like one in whom hope has been new-born. End of chapter 29「Chapter 30 of the Money Moon – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. – The Money Moon – A Romance by Geoffrey Farnell – Chapter 30 how Anthea gave her promise. "'And so he has really gone?' Miss Priscilla sighed as she spoke, and looked up from her needlework to watch Anthea, who sat biting her pen and frowning down at the blank sheet of paper before her. "'And so he is really gone?' "'Who? Mr. Bellew? Oh, yes. He went very early.' Yes, and without any breakfast. That was his own fault, said Anthea, and without even saying good-bye. Perhaps he was in a hurry, Anthea suggested. Oh, dear me, no, my dear. I don't believe Mr. Bellew was ever in a hurry in all his life. No, said Anthea, giving her pen a vicious bite. I don't believe he ever was. He is always so hatefully placid and deliberate. And here she bit her pen again. "'Eh, my dear?' exclaimed Miss Priscilla, pausing with her needle in midair. "'Did you say hatefully?' "'Yes. Aunt Thea! I hate him, Aunt Priscilla. Eh, my dear! That was why I sent him away. You sent him away? Yes. But Aunt Thea, why? Oh, Aunt Priscilla, surely you never believed in the fortune? Surely you guessed it was his money that paid back the mortgage, 
didn't you, Aunt? Didn't you? Well, my dear, but then he did it so very tactfully, and, and I had hoped, my dear, that that I should marry him, and settle the obligation that way, perhaps. Well, yes, my dear, I did hope so. Oh, I'm going to marry. Then why did you send? I'm going to marry Mr. Cassilis whenever he pleases. Anthea! The word was a cry, and her needlework slipped from Miss Priscilla's nerveless fingers. He asked me to write and tell him if ever I change my mind. "'Oh, my dear, my dear!' cried Miss Priscilla, reaching out, imploring hands. "'You never mean it. You are all distraught today, tired and worn out with worry, and loss of sleep. Wait!' "'Wait?' repeated Anthea bitterly. "'For what?' "'To marry him. Oh, Anthea, you never mean it. Think, think what you are doing.' I thought of it all last night, Aunt Priscilla, and all this morning, and I have made up my mind. You mean to write? Yes. To tell Mr. Cassilis that you will marry him? Yes. But now Miss Priscilla rose, and next moment was kneeling beside Anthea's chair. Oh, my dear, she pleaded, you that I love like my own flesh and blood, don't. Oh, Anthea, don't do what can never be undone. Don't give your youth and beauty to one who can never, never make you happy. Oh, Anthea! Dear Aunt Priscilla, I would rather marry one I don't love than have to live beholden all my days to a man that I hate. Now, as she spoke, though her embrace was as ready and her hands as gentle as ever, yet Miss Priscilla saw that her proud face was set and stern. So she presently rose, sighing, and, taking her little crutch-stick, tapped dolefully away, and left Anthea to write her letter. And now, hesitating no more, Anthea took up her pen and wrote. Surely a very short missive for a love letter. And when she had folded and sealed it, she tossed it aside, and, laying her arms upon the table, hid her face with a long, shuddering sigh. In a little while she rose, and, taking up the letter, went out to find Adam. But remembering that he had gone to Cranbrook with small Porges, she paused irresolute, and then turned her steps toward the orchard. Hearing voices, she stopped again, and, glancing about, espied the sergeant and Miss Priscilla. She had given both her hands into the sergeant's one great solitary fist, and he was looking down at her and she was looking up at him, and upon the face of each was a great and shining joy. And seeing all this, Anthea felt herself very lonely all at once, and turning aside, saw all things through a blur of sudden tears. She was possessed also of a sudden fierce loathing of the future, a horror because of the promise her letter contained. Nevertheless, she was firm, and resolute on her course because of the pride that burned within her. So thus it was that as the sergeant presently came striding along on his homeward way, he was suddenly aware of Miss Anthea standing before him, whereupon he halted, and, removing his hat, wished her a good afternoon. Sergeant, said she, will you do something for me? Anything you ask me, Miss Anthea, ma'am, ever and always. I want you to take this letter to Mr. Cassilis, will you?" The sergeant hesitated unwontedly, turning his hat about and about in his hand. Finally he put it on, out of the way. "'Will you, sergeant?' "'Since you ask me, Miss Anthea, ma'am, I will. Give it into his own hand. Miss Anthea, ma'am, I will. Thank you. Here it is, sergeant. And so she turned, and was gone, leaving the sergeant staring down at the letter in his hand, and shaking his head over it. Anthea walked on hastily, never looking behind, and so, coming back to the house, threw herself down by the open window, 
and stared out with unseeing eyes at the roses nodding slumberous heads in the gentle breeze. So the irrevocable step was taken. She had given her promise to marry Cassilis whenever he would, and must abide by it. Too late now, any hope of retreat, she had deliberately chosen her course, and must follow it to the end. Begging your pardon, Miss Anthea, ma'am. She started, and, glancing round, espied Adam. Oh, you startled me, Adam. What is it? Begging your pardon, Miss Anthea, but is it true is Mr. Bellow be gone away for good? Yes, Adam. Why, then, all I can say is, as I'm sorry, ah, oh, mortal sorry I be, in my art, ma'am, my art likewise gloomy. Were you so fond of him, Adam? Well, Miss Anthea, considering as he were the best, good-naturedest, properest kind of gentleman as ever was, what I tell you is over and above all this, he could use his fists better than any man as ever I see, him having knocked me into a dry ditch, though, uh, to be sure, I likewise drawed his claret, begging your pardon, I'm sure, Miss Anthea, all of which happened on account of me finding him a-sleepin' in your A, ma'am. When I tell you furthermore, as he treated me ever as a man, and went no ways above shaking my hand or smoking a pipe with me, sociable like, would I tell you as he were the finest gentleman and properest man as ever I knowed or heard tell on? Why, I think as the word fond be about the size of it, Miss Anthea, ma'am. Saying which, Adam nodded several times and bestowed an emphatic backhanded knock to the crown of his hat. You used to sit together very often, under the big apple tree, didn't you, Adam? Ah, many a many a night, Miss Anthea. Did he ever tell you much of his life, Adam? Why, yes, Miss Anthea. Told me something about his travels. Told me as he'd shot lions and tigers, away out in India and Africa. Did he ever mention... Well, Miss Anthea, said he inquiringly, seeing she had paused. Did he ever speak of the lady he is going to marry? Lady? repeated Adam, giving a sudden twist to his hat. Yes, the lady who lives in London. Uh, no, Miss Anthea, answered Adam, screwing his hat tighter and tighter. Why, what do you mean? I mean, as there never was no lady, Miss Anthea, neither up in London, nor nowhere else, as I ever heard on. But, oh, Adam, you, you told me. Ah, for sure I told you. But it were a lie, Miss Anthea. Leastways, it weren't the truth. You see, I were afraid as you'd refuse to take the money for the furniture, unless I made you believe as he wanted it uncommon bad. So I up and told ye as he'd bought it all on account of him being matrimonially took with a young lady up to London. And then you went to him and warned him, and told him of the story you had invented. I did, Miss Anthea. At first I thought as he were going to up and give me one for myself, but afterwards he took it very quiet, and told me as I'd done quite right, and agreed to play the game. And that's all about it, and glad I am as it be off my mind at last. And now, Miss Anthea, ma'am, seeing you're that rich, with Master Georgie's fortune, why you can pay back for the furniture, if so be you're minded to. And I hope as you'll agree with me as I done it all for the best, Miss Anthea. Here Adam unscrewed his hat and knocked out the wrinkles against his knee, which done he glanced at Anthea. Why, what is it, Miss Anthea? Nothing, Adam. I haven't slept well lately, that's all. Ah, well, you'll be all right again now. We all shall. Now the mortgage be paid off, shall we, Miss Anthea? Yes, Adam. We had a great day over to Grand Rook, Master Georgie and me. He be in the kitchen now with prudence, a eating of bread and jam. Good night, Miss Anthea, ma'am. If you should be wanting me again, I shall be in the stables. Good night, Miss Anthea. So honest, well-meaning Adam touched his forehead with a square-ended finger and trudged away. But Anthea sat there, very still, with drooping head and vacant eyes. And so it was done. The irrevocable step had been taken. She had given her promise. So now, 
having chosen her course, she must follow it to the end. For in Arcadia it would seem that a promise is still a sacred thing. Now, in a while, lifting her eyes, they encountered those of the smiling cavalier above the mantel. Then, as she looked, she stretched out her arms with a sudden, yearning gesture. Oh, she whispered, if I were only just a picture like you. End of chapter 30「Chapter thirty one of the Money Moon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Money Moon, a Romance by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter thirty one, which, being the last, is very properly the longest in the book. In those benighted days when men went abroad, cased in steel, and, upon very slight provocation, were wont to smite each other with axes and clubs, to buffet and skewer each other with spears, lances, swords, and divers other barbarous engines, yet in that dark and doughty age, ignorant though they were of all those smug maxims and excellent moralities with which we are so happily blessed, even in that unhallowed day, when the solemn tread of the policeman's foot was all unknown, they had evolved for themselves a code of rules whereby to govern their life and conduct. Amongst these it was tacitly agreed upon and understood that a spoken promise was a pledge, and held to be a very sacred thing, and he who broke faith committed all the cardinal sins. Indeed, their laws were very few, and simple, easily understood, and well calculated to govern man's conduct to his fellow. In this day of ours, ablaze with learning and culture, veneered with a fine civilization, our laws are complex beyond all knowing and expression. Man regulates his conduct to them, and is as virtuous and honest as the law compels him to be. This is the age of money, and therefore an irreverent age. It is also the age of respectability, with a very large R, and the policeman's bludgeon. But in Arcadia, because it is an old world place where life follows an even simple course, where money is as scarce as roguery, the old law still holds. A promise once given is a sacred obligation, and not to be set aside. Even the blackbird, who lived in the inquisitive apple tree, understood, and was aware of this. It had been born in him, and had grown with his feathers. Therefore, though to be sure he had spoken no promise, signed no bond, nor affixed his mark to any agreement, still he had, nevertheless, borne in mind a certain request preferred to him when the day was very young. Thus, with a constancy of purpose worthy of all imitation, he had given all his mind and thought to the composition of a song with a new theme. He had applied himself to it most industriously all day long, and now, as the sun began to set, he had at last worked it all out, every note, every quaver, and trill. And perched upon a lookout branch, he kept his bold, bright eye turned toward a certain rustic seat hard by, uttering a melodious note or two every now and then, from pure impatience. And presently, sure enough, he spied her for whom he waited, the tall, long-limbed, supple-waisted creature whose skin was pink and gold like the peaches and apricots in the garden, and with soft little rings of hair that would have made such an excellent lighting to a nest. From this strictly utilitarian point of view he had often admired her hair had this blackbird fellow, as she passed to and fro among her flowers, or paused to look up at him and listen to his song, or even sometimes to speak to him in her sweet, low voice. But today she seemed to have forgotten him altogether. She did not even glance his way. Indeed, she walked with bent head, and seemed to keep her eyes always upon the ground. Therefore the blackbird hopped a little further along the branch, and peered over to look down at her with first one round eye, and then the other, as she sank upon the seat nearby, and leaned her head wearily against the great tree behind. And thus he saw, upon the pink and gold of her cheek, something that shone and twinkled like a drop of dew. If the blackbird wondered at this, and was inclined to be curious, 
He sturdily repressed the weakness, for here was the audience, seated and waiting, all expectation for him to begin. So without more ado, he settled himself upon the bow, lifted his head, stretched his throat, and, from his yellow bill, poured forth a flood of golden melody as he burst forth into his Song of Memory. And what a song it was, so full of passionate entreaty, of tender pleading, of haunting sweetness, that, as she listened, the bright drop quivering upon her lashes fell and was succeeded by another and another. Nor did she attempt to check them or wipe them away. Only she sat and listened with her heavy head pillowed against the great tree, while the blackbird, glancing down at her every now and then with critical eye to mark the effect of some particularly difficult passage, piped surely as he had never done before, until the listener's proud face sank lower and lower, and was, at last, hidden in her hands. Seeing which, the blackbird, like the true artist he was, fearing an anticlimax, very presently ended his song with a long-drawn plaintive note. But Anthea sat there with her proud head bowed low, long after he had retired for the night. And the sun went down, and the shadows came creeping stealthily about her, and the moon began to rise, big and yellow, over the upland. But Anthea still sat there with her head, once more resting wearily against King Arthur, watching the deepening shadows, until she was roused by small Porges's hand upon hers, at his voice, saying, Why, I do believe you're crying, Auntie Anthea, and why are you here, all alone and by yourself? I was listening to the blackbird, dear. I never heard him sing quite so beautifully before. But blackbirds don't make people cry, and I know you've been crying, because you sound all quivery, you know. Do I, Georgie? Yes. Is it because you feel lonely? Yes, dear. You cried an awful lot lately, Auntie Anthea. Have I, dear? Yes. And it worries me, you know. Oh, I'm afraid I've been a great responsibility to you, Georgie dear, she said with a rueful little laugh. Afraid you have, but I don't mind the responsibility. I'll always take care of you, you know, nodded Small Porges, sitting down, the better to get his arm protectingly about her, while Anthea stooped to kiss the top of his curly head. I promised my Uncle Porges I'd always take care of you, and so I will. Yes, dear. Uncle Porges told me, never mind, dear, don't let's talk of him. Do you still hate him, then, Auntie Anthea? Hush, dear, it's very wrong to hate people. Yes, of course it is. Then perhaps, if you don't hate him any more, you like him a bit, just a teeny bit, you know? Why, there's the clock striking half past eight, Georgie. Yes, I hear it, but... Do you, the teeniest bit? Oh, can't you like him just a bit, for my sake, Auntie Anthea? I'm always trying to please you, and I found you the fortune, you know. So now I want you to please me, and tell me you like him, for my sake. But, oh, Georgie, dear, you don't understand. Because, you see, Small Porges continued, after all, I found him for you, under a hedge, you know. Ah, oh, why did you, Georgie, dear? We were so happy before he came. But you couldn't have been, you know. You weren't married, even then. So you couldn't have been really happy, you know, said Small Porges, shaking his head. Why, Georgie, what do you mean? Well, Uncle Porges told me that nobody can live happy ever after unless they're married first. So that was why I arranged for him to marry you, so you could both be happy and all revelry and joy, like the fairy tale, you know. But, you see, we aren't in a fairy tale, dear, so I'm afraid we must make the best of things as they are. And here she sighed again and rose. Come, Georgie, it's much later than I thought, and quite time you were in bed, dear. All right, Auntie Anthea, only, don't you think it's just a bit cruel to send a boy to bed and so very early, and when the moon's so big and everything looks so frightfully fine? Sides. 
"'Well, what now?' she asked. A little wearily, as obedient to his pleading gesture, she sat down again. "'Why, you haven't answered my question yet, you know.' "'What question?' said she, not looking at him. "'About my Uncle Porges.' "'But, Georgie, I, you do like him just a bit, don't you? Please?' Small Porges was standing before her as he waited for her answer. But now, seeing how she hesitated and avoiding his eyes, he put one small hand beneath the dimple in her chin, so that she was forced to look at him. "'You do, please, don't you?' he pleaded. Anthea hesitated, but after all, he was gone, and nobody could hear. And small Porges was so very small. And who could resist the entreaty in his big, wistful eyes? Surely not Anthea. Therefore, with a sudden gesture of abandonment, she leaned forward in his embrace, and rested her weary head against his manly small shoulder. Yes, she whispered, just as much as you like Mr. Cassilis, he whispered back. Yes, a bit more, just a teeny bit more. Yes, a lot more, lots and lots, oceans more. Yes, the word was spoken and having uttered it, Anthea grew suddenly hot with shame and mightily angry with herself, and would straightway have given the world to have it unsaid, the more so as she felt small Portis's clasp tighten joyfully, and, looking up, fancied she read something like triumph in his look. She drew away from him, rather hastily, and rose to her feet. Come, said she, speaking now in a vastly different tone, it must be getting very late. Yes, I specs it'll soon be nine o'clock now, he nodded. Then you ought to be in bed, fast asleep, instead of talking such nonsense out here. So, come along, at once, sir. But can't I stay up just a little while? You see, no. You see, it's just a magnificent night. It feels as though things might happen. Don't be so silly. Well, but it does, you know. What do you mean? What things? Well, it feels... No me, to me. I specs there's lots of elves about, hidden in the shadows, you know, and peeping at us. There aren't any elves or gnomes, said Anthea, petulantly, for she was still furiously angry with herself. But my Uncle Porges told me... Oh, cried Anthea, stopping her foot suddenly. Can't you talk of anyone or anything but him? I'm tired to death of him and his very name. But I thought you liked him an awful lot, and, well, I don't. But you said, never mind what I said. It's time you were in bed asleep, so come along at once, sir. So they went on through the orchard together, very silently, for small Porges was inclined to be indignant, but much more inclined to be hurt. Thus they had not gone so very far when he spoke in a voice that he would have described as quivery. Don't you think that you're j just the teeniest bit cruel to me, Auntie Anthea? He inquired wistfully. After I prayed and prayed till I found a fortune for you, don't you, please? Surely Anthea was a creature of moods tonight, for even while he spoke, she stopped and turned, and fell on her knees and caught him in her arms, kissing him many times. Yes, yes, dear, I'm hateful to you, horrid to you, but I don't mean to be there. Forgive me. Oh, it's all right again now, Auntie Anthea, thank you. I only thought you were just a bit hard, because it is such a... Magnificent night, isn't it? Yes, dear, and perhaps there are gnomes and pixies about. Anyhow, we could pretend there are, if you like, as we used to. Oh, will you? Well, that would be fine. Then please, may I go with you as far as the brook? We'll wander, you know. I've never wandered with you in the moonlight, and I do love to hear the brook talking to itself. So, will you wander just this once? Well said Anthea, hesitating. It's very late. Nearly nine o'clock. Yes, but, oh, please don't forget that I found a fortune for you. <laughs> very well, she smiled, just this once. 
Now as they went together, hand in hand, through the moonlight, small Porges talked very fast and very much at random, while his eyes, bright and eager, glanced expectantly towards every patch of shadow, doubtless in search of gnomes and pixies. But Anthea saw nothing of this, heard nothing of the suppressed excitement in his voice, for she was thinking that by now Mr. Cassilis had read her letter, that he might, even then, be on his way to Dapplemere. She even fancied, once or twice, that she could hear the gallop of his horse's hoofs, and when he came he would want to kiss her. "'Why do you shiver so, Auntie Anthea? Are you cold?' "'No, dear.' "'Well, then, why are you so quiet to me? I've asked you a question three times.' "'Oh, have you, dear? I, I was thinking. What was the question?' I was asking you if you would be awful frightened supposing we did find a pixie or a gnome in the shadows, and would you be so very awfully frightened if a gnome, a, a great big one, you know, came jumping out and ran off with you? Should you? No, said Anthea with another shiver. No, dear, I, I think I should be rather glad of it. Should you, Auntie? I'm so awful glad you wouldn't be frightened. Of course, I don't suppose there are gnomes, I mean great big ones, really, you know, but there might be on a magnificent night like this. If you shiver again, Auntie, you'll have to take my coat. I thought I heard a horse galloping. Hush! They had reached the stile by now, the stile with the crooked, lurking nail, and she leaned there a while to listen. I'm sure I heard something, away there, on the road. I don't said Small Porges stoutly. So take my hand, please, and let me assist you over the stile. So they crossed the stile, and presently came to the brook that was the most impertinent brook in the world. And here, upon the little rustic bridge, they stopped to look down at the sparkle of the water, and to listen to its merry voice. Yes, indeed, tonight it was as impertinent as ever, laughing and chuckling to itself among the hollows, and whispering scandalously in the shadows. It seemed to Anthea that it was laughing at her, mocking and taunting her with the future. And now amid the laughter were sobs and tearful murmurs, and now, again, it seemed to be the prophetic voice of old Nanny. By force you shall be wooed, and by force you shall be wed, and there is no man strong enough to do it, but him is bears the tiger mark upon him. The tiger mark! Alas, how very far from the truth were poor old Nanny's dreams. After all, the dreams which Anthea had very nearly believed in, once or twice, how foolish it had all been. And yet, even now, Anthea had been leaning over the gurgling waters while all this passed through her mind, but now she started at the sound of a heavy footfall on the planking of the bridge behind her, and in that same moment she was encircled by a powerful arm, caught up in a strong embrace, swung from her feet, and bore away through the shadows of the little copse. It was very dark in the wood, but she knew instinctively whose arms these were that held her so close and carried her so easily, away through the shadows of the wood, away from the haunting, hopeless dread of the future from which there had seemed no chance or hope of escape. And knowing all this, she made no struggle and uttered no word. And now the trees thinned out, and from under her lashes she saw the face above her, the thick black brows drawn together, the close set of the lips, the grim prominence of the strong square chin. And now they were in the road, and now he lifted her into an automobile, had sprung in beside her, and they were off, gliding swift and ever swifter under the shadows of the trees. And still neither spoke, nor looked at each other, only she leaned away from him against the cushions, while he kept his frowning eyes fixed upon the road ahead. And ever the great car flew onward faster and faster, yet not so fast as the beating of her heart, wherein shame and anger and fear and another feeling strove and fought for mastery. But at last, finding him so silent and impassive, she must needs steal a look at him beneath her lashes. He wore no hat, 
And as she looked upon him, with his yellow hair, his length of limb, and his massive shoulders, he might have been some fierce viking, and she his captive, taken by strength of arm, borne away by force. By force. And hereupon, as the car hummed over the smooth road, it seemed to find a voice, a subtle, mocking voice, very like the voice of the brook, that murmured to her over and over again. By force you shall be wooed, and by force you shall be wed. The very trees whispered it as they passed, and her heart throbbed in time to it. By force ye shall be wooed, and by force ye shall be wed. So she leaned as far from him as she might, watching him with frightened eyes while he frowned ever upon the road in front, and the car rocked and swayed with their going as they whirled onward through the moonlight, and through the shadow faster and faster yet not so fast as the beating of her heart, wherein was fear and shame and anger and another feeling. But greatest of all now was fear. Could this be the placid, soft-spoken gentleman she had known, this man with the implacable eyes and the brutal jaw, who neither spoke to nor looked at her, but frowned always at the road in front? And so the fear grew and grew within her, fear of the man whom she knew and knew not at all. She clasped her hands nervously together, watching him with dilating eyes as the car slowed down, for the road made a sudden turn hereabouts. And still he neither looked at nor spoke to her, and therefore, because she could bear the silence no longer, she spoke, in a voice that sounded strangely faint and far away, and that shook and trembled in spite of her. Where are you taking me? To be married, he answered, never looking at her. You wouldn't dare. Wait and see, he nodded. Oh, but what do you mean? The fear in her voice was more manifest than ever. I mean that you are mine. You always were. You always must and shall be. So I'm going to marry you, in about half an hour, by special license. Still he did not even glance towards her, and she looked away over the countryside, all lonely and desolate under the moon. I want you, you see, he went on. I want you more than I ever wanted anything in this world. I need you, because without you my life would be utterly purposeless and empty. So I have taken you. Because you are mine, I know it. Ah, yes, and deep down in your woman's heart you know it, too. And so... I am going to marry you, yes I am, unless, and here he brought the car to a standstill, and turning, looked at her for the first time. And now, before the look in his eyes, her own wavered and fell, lest he should read within them that which she would fain hide from him, and which she knew they must reveal, that which was neither shame, nor anger, nor fear, but the other feeling for which she dared find no name. And thus, for a long moment, there was silence. At last she spoke, though with her eyes still hidden. Unless, she repeated breathlessly, Anthea, look at me. But Anthea only drooped her head the lower, wherefore he leaned forward and, even as small Porges had done, set his hand beneath the dimple in her chin and lifted the proud, unwilling face. Anthea, Look at me. And now what could Anthea do but obey? Unless, said he, as her glance at last met his, unless you can tell me, now, as your eyes look into mine, that you love Cassilis, tell me that, and I will take you back this very instant, and never trouble you again. But unless you do tell me that, why then, your pride shall not blast two lives, if I can help it. Now speak. But Althea was silent. Also, she would have turned aside from his searching look, but that his arms were about her, strong and compelling. So, needs must she suffer him to look down into her very heart, for it seemed to her that, in that moment, he had rent away every stitch and shred of pride's unfolding mantle, and that he saw the truth at last. But if he had, he gave no sign. Only he turned and set the car humming upon its way once more. 
On they went through the midsummer night, up hill and downhill by crossroad and by lane, until, as they climbed a long ascent, they beheld a tall figure standing upon the top of the hill, in the attitude of one who waits, and who, spying them, immediately raised a very stiff left arm, whereupon the figure was joined by another. Now, as the car drew nearer, Anthea, with a thrill of pleasure, recognized the sergeant, standing very much as though he were on parade, and with honest face Peter Day beside him, who stumped joyfully forward, and, with a bob of his head, and a scrape of his wooden leg, held out his hand to her. Like one in a dream, she took the sailor's hand to step from the car, and, like one in a dream, she walked on between the soldier and the sailor, who now reached out to her, each a hand equally big and equally gentle, to aid her up certain crumbling and time-worn steps. On they went together until they were come to a place of whispering echoes, where lights burned few and dim. And here, still as one in a dream, she spoke those words which gave her life, henceforth, into the keeping of him who stood beside her, whose strong hand trembled as he set upon her finger that which is an emblem of eternity. Like one in a dream, she took the pen and signed her name, obediently, where they directed. And yet, could this really be herself, this silent, submissive creature? And now they were out upon the moonlit road again, seated in the car, while Peter Day, his hat in his hand, was speaking to her. And yet, was it to her? Mrs. Bellew, ma'am, he was saying, on this here momentous occasion, momentous is the only word for it, Peter Day, nodded the sergeant, on this here momentous occasion, Mrs. Bellew, the sailor proceeded, my shipmate Dick and me, ma'am, respectfully beg the favor of saluting the bride. Mrs. Bellew, by your leave, here's health and happiness, ma'am. And hereupon the old sailor kissed her right heartily, which done he made way for the sergeant, who, after a moment's hesitation, followed suit. A fair wind and prosperous, cried Peter Day, flourishing his hat. And God bless you both, said the sergeant, as the car shot away. So it was done. The irrevocable step was taken. Her life and future had passed forever into the keeping of him who sat so silent beside her, who neither spoke nor looked at her, but frowned ever at the road before him. On sped the car, faster and faster, yet not so fast as the beating of her heart, wherein there was yet something of fear and shame, but greatest of all was that other emotion, and the name of it was Joy. Now, presently the car slowed down, and he spoke to her, though without turning his head. And yet, something in his voice thrilled through her strangely. Look, Anthea, the moon is at the full tonight. Yes, she answered, and happiness shall come riding astride the full moon, he quoted. Old Nanny is rather a wonderful old witch after all, isn't she? Yes. And then there is our nephew. My dear little Porges, but for him happiness would have been a stranger to me all my days, Anthea. He dreamed that the money moon spoke to him, and... But he shall tell you of that for himself. But Anthea noticed that he spoke without once looking at her. Indeed, it seemed that he avoided glancing towards her of set design and purpose. And his deep voice quivered now and then in a way that she had never heard before. Therefore her heart throbbed the faster, and she kept her gaze bent downward, and thus, chancing to see the shimmer of that which was upon her finger, she blushed and hid it in a fold of her gown. Anthea, yes? You have no regrets, have you? No, she whispered. We shall soon be home now. Yes. And you are mine forever and always? Anthea, you aren't afraid of me any more, are you? No. Nor ever will be? Nor ever will be. Now as the car swept round a bend, behold yet two other figures standing beside the way. Yo-ho, Captain! cried a voice. Oh, please, heave to, Uncle Porges! And forth to meet them came small Porges running 
Yet remembering Miss Priscilla tapping along beside him, he must needs turn back, to give her his hand like the kindly, small gentleman that he was. And now Miss Priscilla had Anthea in her arms, and they were kissing each other and murmuring over each other as loving women will, while small Porges stared at the car, and all things pertaining thereto, more especially the glaring headlights with great wondering eyes. At length, having seen Anthea and Miss Priscilla safely stowed, he clambered up beside Bellew, and gave him the word to proceed. What pen could describe his ecstatic delight as he sat there, with one hand hooked into the pocket of Uncle Porges's coat, and with the cool night wind whistling through his curls? So great was it, indeed, that Bellew was constrained to turn aside and make a wide detour, purely for the sake of the radiant joy in small Porges's eager face. When at last they came within sight of Dapplemere, and the great machine crept up the rutted, grassy lane, small Porges sighed and spoke. "'Auntie Anthea,' said he, "'are you sure you are merry, nice and tight, you know?' "'Yes, dear,' she answered. "'Why, yes, Georgie. "'But you don't look a bit different, you know, either of you. "'Are you quite sure? "'Cause I shouldn't like you to disappoint me, after all. "'Never fear, my Porges,' said Bellew. "'I made quite sure of it while I had the chance. "'Look!' "'As he spoke, he took Anthea's left hand, "'drawing it out into the moonlight, "'so that small Porges could see the shining ring upon her finger. "'Oh!' said he, nodding his head. "'Then that makes it all right, I suppose. "'And you aren't angry with me "'cause I let a great big gnome come and carry you off, "'are you, Auntie Anthea?' "'No, dear.' "'Why, then, everything's quite magnificent, isn't it?' And now we're going to live happy ever after, all of us. And Uncle Porges is going to take us to sail the oceans in his ship. He's got a ship that all belongs to his very own self, you know, Auntie Anthea. So all will be revelry and joy, just like the fairy tale after all. And so at last they came to the door of the ancient house of Dapplemere, whereupon, very suddenly, Adam appeared, bare-armed from the stables, who, looking from Bellew's radiant face to Miss Anthea's shy eyes, threw back his head, vented his great laugh, and was immediately solemn again. "'Miss Anthea,' said he, wringing and twisting at his hat, or, I think I should say, Mrs. Bellew, ma'am, there ain't no word for it, leastways not as I know on, know how, no words be strong enough to tell me the J-O-Y joy, ma'am, as feels us, one and all.' Here he waved his hand to where stood the comely prudence with the two rosy-cheeked maids peeping over her buxom shoulders. Only, pursued Adam, I be glad, ah, mortal glad, I be, as tis you, Mr. Bellew, sir. There ain't a man in all the world, or as you might say, universe, as is so proper as you to be the husband to our Miss Anthea. This was not know-how, Mr. Bellew, sir. I wish you joy, a joy you shall grow with the years, and abide with you always, both on ye. That is a very excellent thought, Adam, said Bellew and I think I should like to shake hands on it. Which they did, forthwith. And now, Mrs. Bellew, ma'am, Adam concluded, with your kind permission, I'll step into the kitchen and drink a glass of Prue's ale to your health and happiness. If I stay here any longer, I won't say, but what I shall burst out a singing in your very face, ma'am, for I do be that happy-hearted. Lord! With which exclamation, Adam laughed again, and turning about, strode away to the kitchen, with Prudence and the rosy-cheeked maids laughing as he went. "'Oh, my dears,' said little Miss Priscilla, "'I've hoped for this, prayed for it, "'because I believe he is worthy of you, Anthea, "'and because you have both loved each other "'from the very beginning. "'Oh, dear me, yes, you have. "'And so, my dears, your happiness is my happiness. "'Oh, goodness me!' Here I stand, talking sentimental nonsense, while our small Porges is simply dropping asleep as he stands. Afraid I am a bit tired, small Porges admitted, but it's been a magnificent night. And I think, Uncle Porges, when we sail away in your ship, I think I'd like to sail round the horn first, because they say it's always blowing, you know, and I should love to hear it blow. And now, good night. "'Wait a minute, my Porges. Just tell us what it was the Money Moon said to you last night, will you?' "'Well,' 
said Small Porges, shaking his head and smiling a slow, sly smile. I don't suppose we'd better talk about it, Uncle Porges, cause you see, it was such a very great secret and sights. I'm awful sleepy, you know. So saying, he nodded slumberously, kissed Anthea sleepily, and, giving Miss Priscilla his hand, went drowsily into the house. But, as for Bellow, it seemed to him that this was the hour for which he had lived all his life, and though he spoke nothing of this thought, yet Anthea knew it instinctively, as she knew why he had avoided looking at her hitherto, and what had caused the tremor in his voice, despite his iron self-control. And therefore, now that they were alone, she spoke hurriedly, and at random. What did he, Georgie, mean by your ship? Why, I promised to take him a cruise in the yacht, if you cared to come, Anthea. Yacht? she repeated. Are you so dreadfully rich? I'm afraid we are, he nodded. But at least it has the advantage of being better than if we were dreadfully poor, hasn't it? Now, in the midst of the garden, there was an old sundial worn by time and weather, and it chanced that they came and leaned there side by side. And, looking down upon the dial, Bellew saw certain characters graven thereon in the form of a poesy. "'What does it say here, Anthea?' he asked. But Anthea shook her head. "'That you must read for yourself,' she said, not looking at him. So he took her hand in his, and, with her slender finger, spelled out this motto. Time and youth do flee away, love, O oh love then, whiles ye may. Anthea, said he, and again she heard the tremor in his voice, you have been my wife nearly three quarters of an hour, and all that time I haven't dared to look at you, because if I had I must have kissed you and I meant to wait until your own good time. But, Anthea, you have never yet told me that you love me. Anthea? She did not speak or move. Indeed, she was so very still that he needs must bend down to see her face. Then all at once her lashes were lifted, her eyes looked up into his, deep and dark with passionate tenderness. Aunt Priscilla, was quite right, she said, speaking in her low, thrilling voice. I have loved you from the very beginning, I think. And with a soft, murmurous sigh, she gave herself into his embrace. Now, far away across the meadow, Adam was plodding his homeward way, and as he trudged, he sang to himself in a harsh but not a musical voice, and the words of his song were these. When I am dead, diddle diddle, as well may hap, you'll bury me, diddle diddle, under the tap. Under the tap, diddle diddle, I'll tell you why, that I may drink, diddle diddle, when I am dry. End of chapter 31 And End of The Money Moon by Geoffrey Farnell Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois